Uh, let me introduce next speaker, Dr. Sanjeeva Gunasekara. He's the pediatric uh, oncologist working at uh, National Lakanshi Institute, Maharagama, and he's uh, he's a visiting lecturer, lecturer at uh, Kotalawa Defense University. He has completed his fellowship in pediatric hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplantation at Birmingham's Children's Hospital, UK. Ms. Sanjeeva. Good morning, everyone. Um, if uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Haddock uh, uh, is still there, uh, let me just uh, let him know that uh, we don't we don't want to talk about cricket these days because the bragging rights are right now at uh, with the UK. Um, so uh, the topic given to me today is optimizing maintenance chemotherapy of pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, so we are running behind time, so I would be rushing through a few slides. I uh, hope, you, hope you don't mind. Uh, so when you talk about maintenance chemotherapy, actually what we are talking about is maintaining remission uh, in ALL chemotherapy. So this is usually in multi-phase uh, chemotherapy regimes where remission is achieved through high-dose chemotherapy. Um, uh, then we want to continue uh, that remission using low-dose chemotherapy probably for a longer duration of time. Um, so this talk uh, the, is basically will be of two halves. First half, the first 10 minutes, I would like to talk about how we arrived at the current standard of care for ALL maintenance chemotherapy. I think this will be useful uh, when in, in the present day uh, when we have to sometimes um, go off protocol due to, uh, to limitations imposed by this COVID pandemic and decide sometimes have to omit drugs, sometimes to um, uh, substitute drugs and various things. So uh, having an idea how the current standard of care was achieved might be helpful in when we make these decisions, which are not often in the uh, our uh, accepted protocols. And, uh, and the, the second half of this talk would be how we handle basically the practical aspects uh, we face in our day-to-day -day practice. This is from our experience, and this is certainly up for discussion. Um, so when we decide how the present standard of care uh, was decided on, uh, we, we have to answer two main questions and probably two sub-questions of those. Those are how did we choose the drugs we use now, and, uh, and probably a sub-question of that is whether there, is there a place for adding VCR dexamethasone pulses to this chemotherapy? And the next question would be the duration of treatment and probably whether it's different in uh, according to the sex. Um, so uh, when we talk about maintenance chemotherapy, probably it goes back to uh, the father of modern chemotherapy, uh, Sydney Farber of Boston Children's Hospital. When he, for the first time, he dem demonstrated chemotherapy can be used in treatment of any cancer. Uh, when you use aminopterin, which is basically a precursor of the present day drug, methotrexate, which we even use uh, to this day. Um, so uh, addition of 6 mercaptopurine was uh, shown to be prolong this duration of remission by uh, 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 of the NCI later on, and that became a stand early standard of care uh, in treatment of ALL. Uh, but when, actually, the maintenance chemotherapy phase uh, was, and the, and the multi-phase treatment regimes was first put on, uh, first introduced uh, to the world by probably St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital, Donald Prinkle uh, and his team, uh, when they demonstrated that for the first time, uh, children with leukemia probably can be cured of, um, of their disease using chemotherapy alone. Uh, so they use high intense chemotherapy for rem inducing remission and then prolong and prolong remission through a maintenance phase of chemotherapy. Uh, even then they achieved about five year survival of 25% of that time, even during the 1960s. So uh, what they, in, this, in their uh, landmark uh, total chemotherapy pr protocols, the, what they, the, the duration of maintenance chemotherapy they used was for, for three years. So probably that's how um, the initial chemotherapy duration of maintenance was arrived at. Um, 
Uh, then the, the, the subsequent studies, I think, uh, demonstrated there is a synergistic action between methotrexate and 6MP. They are, when, they, when they are used together, the methotrexate um, increased the concentration of 6MP in leukemic cells. So they th probably that supported the, the decision of continuing, uh, so giving them together as maintenance chemotherapy. Um, so the, the duration, although the initial duration uh, in the total, uh, total uh, St. Jude studies were uh, three years, uh, then the, 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 there were multiple studies, which I don't want to show everything, but there were multiple studies whether we can actually reduce the, do reduce the duration or increase the duration. But uh, I think uh, there is a very good meta-analysis uh, they have done about, uh, about all these studies. And what they found out was two years was not inferior uh, to three years, but less than two years. 18 months versus two years um, was certainly inferior. So the, probably the duration of uh, chemotherapy should be uh, two years. Uh, then the question whether we need, whether boys uh, need more maintenance chemotherapy duration. Uh, this is again, um, uh, probably is, uh, the, uh, this was because the, in the, all the early trials, the, the survival figures of males were less. They have uh, increased testicular relapse as well as bone marrow relapse. Uh, and the, most of these relapses were uh, while on maintenance chemotherapy or just after. Uh, so there was a, a, a thought that maybe increasing the maintenance chemotherapy uh, duration might uh, take care of that issue. Um, so uh, in the BFM 99, the boys were given uh, 36 months or three years of maintenance chemotherapy, uh, and uh, this was this the increased duration. Uh, the, the idea was that most beneficial was for the patients who have got less intense initial induction chemotherapy. That is the, the standard risk patients. However, this is not a random. Uh, the, this question was not randomized in the BFM 95. Uh, but when you, when you compare that with the historical cohort uh, of BFM90, uh, where they were given only two years of uh, maintenance chemotherapy in, for boys, um, this, uh, there was a survival benefit of giving an additional year of chemotherapy. Um, so um, the next question we, uh, on our list is that whether addition of vincristine dexamethasone pulses to maintenance chemotherapy is useful or not. Um, so uh, again, the same uh, uh, um, uh, meta-analysis that we, uh, I referred to earlier, which was uh, basically uh, of studies done in the uh, probably 80s and early 90s, um, they, they showed that ad addition of vincristine and dexamethasone uh, was beneficial uh, in terms of uh, uh, event-free survival, but not an overall survival. But please note that the event-free survivors you are talking about ranges from 60 to 65, which is far inferior to what we have now. Uh, so there was a, uh, 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 after that there was an EORTC trial looking at the same question, a randomized group, um, uh, where again, this is that of the standard risk patients. There was some uh, benefit of disease-free survival, but again, no overall survival benefit. Uh, so, but then the but uh, this question was um, asked in a big trial for the first time. Uh, I think later on, this is from the BFM group, uh, where there were more than two thousand patients randomized again for uh, uh, increasing dexamethasone pulses uh, or not, and in that almost the lines overlapped completely, and there was no uh, EFS or overall survival benefit. So. What's the current status of main treatment groups now regarding these two questions? Uh, so if you see the, the, the UK ALL, um, so they still, ALL 2011, which is the ongoing trial in the UK right now, they still give three years uh, for boys and two years for girls for maintenance uh, chemotherapy. Uh, probably this would be changing in their new trials, which are not uh, have started yet. Uh, in the COG, uh, all IT new trials, there is no difference between males and females in terms of duration of uh, chemotherapy duration. Uh, and so is BFM. They are also sticking with the equal duration for boys and girls. So regarding the question of pulses in the UKLL, they have randomized uh, uh, patients to get the pulses or not in all treatment groups. 
not just the standard or the, the, the regime may or be, which is the standard or interim risk, but in all treatment groups, the, the, the addition of pulses is randomized. And hopefully this will give us a definitive answer to this uh, question. Um, COG, I believe I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think COG is also uh, investigating the same issue. But BFM has given up on this completely. All BFM schedules will not have pulses uh, for maintenance going forward. So if you go back to answer the questions we had, uh, so what are the drugs we use? Uh, for maintenance chemotherapy, I think it's straightforward. There is no argument over this. It's the four drugs uh, 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 which has been going on for so long. Uh, methotrexate, 6MP, VCR, and dexamethasone. But addition of pulses is still under investigation. Uh, we don't have a clear answer for this uh, at this moment. Um, duration of treatment, again, the consensus seems to be about two years. And uh, do we need to give longer? For boys, probably not. Uh, so uh, again, uh, UK is still continuing it. But the trend is not to give equal duration of treatment for girls and boys both. So what do we do? Uh, we usually, our treatment protocol is basically uh, inspired by the UK in 2011. So we usually give for boys a uh, longer chemotherapy. But we will, uh, we are in the process of looking at our guidelines and we will probably be changing this in the future. Uh, so, and also we, we, we are giving VCR, dexamel zone pulses uh, for maintenance uh, throughout. Uh, this is more controversial uh, to take a decision on, but probably again, we will be looking at this when we are formulating the guidelines. So uh, that's the current standard of care. So what do we do uh, right now? What are the issues we face when we are giving ALL maintenance chemotherapy? I am aware that this majority of this audience are uh, not hemato-oncologists or pediatric oncologists, but you do see a lot of patients who are on ALL maintenance, especially when, you, when you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about this um, uh, in, in, uh, out of Colombo. Uh, so uh, we all know the, what the protocol says for the target uh, hematological parameters, what they should be on while on chemotherapy. The WBC is supposed to be between 1.5 to 3. Absolute neutrophil count 0 0.75 to 1.5. Platelet 75 to 150. But probably it's very difficult for us to keep uh, such a tight control over the, hemato uh, the, the full blood count, the, the parameters. Uh, and and we don't want them to risk uh, going into severe neutropenia or uh, thrombocytopenia because of the supportive care facilities available are not that high. So I, I, I personally would want, uh, would like to keep it at a higher level, and that's that's uh, my personal target. Uh, it's usually around uh, two to three point five, and when the platelet count about uh, uh, hundred to hundred to two hundred. The ANC more than 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000, uh, somewhere there. So that would be the ideal uh, uh, full blood count of a patient who's coming into your clinic uh, for weekly, uh, with a weekly full blood count to when they are on chemo, ALL maintenance chemo. So if the, if the hematological parameters are co uh, consistently high, if the, the, the indicators, uh, the, the ANC and the platelets are consistently high, we need to uh, increase their chemotherapy doses. But I need to, um, at the outset, I need to uh, give a word of warning. We may have to make sure the compliance is proper. If there is poor compliance, that, that will be the probably the number one reason for high, high uh, absolute neutrophil counts and platelets. So then if we go to increase that, and if the, suddenly the compliance improves, and then they are in, in big trouble. So we need to, uh, before we think of increasing doses, we need to um, we need to make sure the compliance is good. So basically, the general advice is to go by about 25% increments, not to increase both together, go with uh, 6MP first and maybe methotrexate. Uh, but, and also we shouldn't be increasing these doses too frequently. The idea is to give at least increase by eight weeks, uh, uh, eight week intervals if they are still high. Again, because we want, we don't want to uh, uh, have fluctuations of their neutrophil count and then be to increase the dose and then they are off uh, chemotherapy for 
another two to three weeks the the, uh, the purpose is lost i think um um uh, the i think prof howard also referred to this uh um the this study and where they clearly shows the, the amount of six six mp you are on during the duration of the of your maintenance chemotherapy will have an impact on the on your overall survival uh, so uh, so in sri lanka uh, we don't have the facilities to measure the tpmt levels um, you might know that tpmt is an enzyme which which is involved in the metabolizing uh, 6mp in the body and the lack of that uh, can cause increased toxicity but our practical experience is that uh, it's known that in the asian region that these um, the 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 tissue deficiency is commoner and in sri lanka also uh, our patients generally don't tolerate the uh, the the protocol doses of 6 megapapurine uh, so um, i think this is a commoner than uh, commoner case that peripheral uh, oncologists might be facing more when they come with lower counts rather than higher counts uh, so the, what, what we need to do is that if they are on the first week of chemotherapy and the uh, increase in dexamethasone pulses are due um, uh, you should even if the low counts is not an indication uh, to stop the vcr dexa pulses and we need to continue that um, so again if the the uh, absolute neutrophil counts are very low you wouldn't want to uh, you have to completely uh, stop all chemotherapy and just continue the the uh, the cotrimoxazole only but if it's around the protocol says 500 to 750 you can basically halve the dose and continue and only stop completely less than 500 but then again i should urge uh, uh, a bit of caution here uh, because you have to take the patients uh, under your care, uh, the circumstances of these patients under your care into consideration. If they are coming from far off, in the, if they, if a, in, a, in an incident of febrile neutropenia, if they can't uh, um, rush to the hospital, um, uh, you would have to really think whether you want to take the risk of um, uh, continuing chemotherapy when they are even when they are below 1,000, even though if they are more than 500 the neutrophil counts. And so uh, usually if you stop the chemotherapy, uh, the 6MP and the, the methotrexate, you will wait till counts go up above 1,000 to restart it. Uh, you wouldn't even, if it, it comes between 500 and 750, you don't want to uh, restart it. So, excuse me. So, but if the count repeatedly drops, you, you stop chemotherapy, then it recovers. You restart 6MP and methotrexate, but then again, two to three weeks time again drops you really have to rethink the, the the dosing what you have given, the baseline dose that you are giving, and probably have to reduce it by 50% and then slowly start increasing again to have a, to achieve a steady state. Um, so um, um, yeah, at this point, I think if you, need, if you are thinking of uh, uh, reducing the doses, I think you need to get in touch with the, the referring consultants, either the pediatric oncologist or the hemato-oncologist, and decide what's the best course of uh, um, uh, best course of action for the patients going forward. Uh, so, and one thing also to remember is uh, trimoxazole can uh, uh, cause uh, bone marrow suppression. So, if persistently low, we have to think whether that's the reason uh, for the low um, low chemotherapy and then uh, uh, low uh, low counts, and then uh, whether we need to change. Uh, change to something like Dapson, which is not easily available to us, and there can be multiple issues in multiple toxicity profile is, uh, is not that great. Uh, so we don't really want to stop the cotrimoxazole unless it's uh, it's proven that's because of cotrimoxazole, uh, and, uh, and they're having clear issues of continuing chemotherapy. So the, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, end soon with a uh, word about other toxicities. Uh, renal toxicity, we need to stop complete if there is grade 3, 4 toxicity, but this is very rare. We have hardly ever seen uh, renal toxicity simply because on patients who are on ALL maintenance chemo. Uh, but liver enzymes, uh, so I think this is what Dr. Ha uh, Prof. Howard was also alluding to. Uh, we shouldn't, we have a practice of doing LFTs in all patients, um, uh, in majority of patients, but really we, do, we don't need to do uh, LFTs unless they are clinically jaundiced, it, because most of the time you will find that there uh, there is some transaminides uh, uh, and then and 
will you be marginal and then we had a doubt about what we want to do but uh, uh, so the basically there is there is some controversy about this statement but it is accepted uh, that we need not do uh, lfts uh, in uh, uh, lfts in uh, uh, patients who are not clinically jaundiced so there is an algorithm how to titrate the the uh, the bilirubin uh, and the uh, the 6 mp and the mtx depending on the bilirubin but we don't take any action just because of transaminitis uh, so mucosite is also can not very common but we also see uh, so I would urge you if, if you think that the mucosite is significant uh, you need to stop especially methotrexate but maybe 6 mp as well and then wait for some time uh, and for things to normalize um, uh, before you restart um, so that's it basically um, I hope to, I managed to give you an overview of ALL maintenance schema therapy and that is uh, helpful for you all thank you uh, thank you very much Sanjeeva I think uh, uh, in leukemia management after the induction phase the one of the main and most important phase is the maintenance phase as you said so what about the lumbar punctures so the, the lumbar puncture, the, the uh, intrathecal, I didn't want to touch that to confuse because mainly the, 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 the audience here will not be involved in doing the intrathecal. Uh, but uh, so the, the, I, the current indication, especially uh, in B cell leukemia, and if you take out the lymphoblastic lymphomas, if they have received um, high dose methotrexate uh, during the, the pre maintenance phase of chemotherapy, there is, a, there is currently you can stop, uh, drop the lumbar punctures complete. Lumbar punctures during intrathecal metoprex state. Thank you very much. And uh, another question, Dr. Sanjeeva, you uh, mentioned the four drugs in, in maintenance. Of course, uh, you mentioned dexamethasone, but we usually use uh, in adults prednisolone. So is there any evidence to say that dexamethasone is superior to prednisolone? In yes, definitely. I think there is evidence, clear evidence to say that there is survival benefit over dexamethasone, uh, from on dexamethasone over prednisolone, and especially with the, the CNS collapses. Uh, so, um, so earlier the BFM group uh, uh, used prednisolone for maintenance chemotherapy, and they are also switching to dexamethasone because of the, the, the perceived benefit. Uh, there's a question about uh, imatinib. So, I think uh, related to Philadelphia positive patients who are on imatinib uh, during maintenance. So the the. Philadelphia chromosome positive patients are total uh, different kettle of fish, uh, uh, which is uh, I'm basically referring to Philadelphia, not uh, what I talked about was all the evidence I presented is not from the patients who are Philadelphia chromosome negative. So uh, for Philadelphia positive, definitely I think we need to continue a TKI, and there is probably now even if they have bone marrow transplant, uh, probably the trend is to, um, uh, to continue with TKI. Uh, even post uh, uh, BMT. Uh, so this is what I've been um, I'm talking about this Philadelphia negative patient. Right, Dr. Sanju. There's one more question. Um, now, there are uh, somebody who's asking about the viral infections, particularly the CMV and fungal infections during maintenance, and how would you get around? Um, so um, so, so uh, probably I would have said this before. Minor viral in infections is not an indication to stop chemotherapy. Uh, if you are very sure about the the patient and you are familiar with the patient and if you can make that clinical judgment that it's a viral infection, you might not, you, you can actually continue chemotherapy. Uh, the fungal infection, we don't hardly, uh, we hardly ever see much fungal, especially systemic fungal infection because of uh, on maintenance phase of chemotherapy. Probably this is because uh, um, the bone marrow suppression is not that great, right? So they are not on neutropenic for a prolonged duration of time. Uh, so, um, but if there is systemic fungal infection, probably um, we have to we have to stop chemotherapy at that point. Do you use the uh, fungal prophylaxis during maintenance? No, we don't. Yeah. We don't use right. fungal. Okay. There was a one question: uh, How to titrate doses depend on the liver function test, MTX and the 6 MP. So liver function test, I think what we are basically, what we are interested in is uh, bilirubin only. Just because of the ALT, ASTs are high, I wouldn't uh, uh, change doses on that. But if it's usually, uh, what they say, the bilirubin is above 50, um, uh, we would first um, 
uh, we would uh, um, stop the MTX and the 6MP, uh, sorry, half the 6MP, sorry, if there is more than 50, stop uh, below 6MP and the MTX, and probably if it's uh, between normal limit 10, uh, 20 and 50 or somewhere there, maybe uh, half it and keep and see where we are doing, and but then again restart only 6MP and the MTX again um, when um, that's completely normalized. Dr. Sanjeev, I think uh, our time is uh, limited. So let me wrap up this symposium by thanking all our panel of intellects on behalf of the SLCO for sharing their knowledge and expertise in the field of hematoncology. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going for a break. Um, now let's take a break of 30 minutes to refresh ourselves before the next symposium. All right, okay, the organizers are uh, informing me that we are allowed only 17 minutes to refresh ourselves. Okay, we are cutting down on you. You can have a cup of tea and come back in 17 minutes. And let me take this opportunity to invite you to experience and explore our virtual platform, which is the first ever 3D and 360 degree medical virtual platform in Sri Lanka. You can play around with it in a 360 degree manner, uh, zoom in and zoom out as well to make the best use of it. Uh, this consists of 12 teaching capsules on a wide array of topics in oncology and are available on demand throughout the sessions. And we, are, we also have an online free paper session where there are six oral presentations and 16 poster presentations. The best oral presentation and uh, uh, poster presentation will be announced during the tea break tomorrow. We will also be able to access the virtual exhibition hall where there are virtual stalls of our sponsors. And there's an information center. And also, if you are bored, please take a minute to enjoy our online leisure hall to see the beauty of Sri Lanka. We'll be back in 17 minutes.